The reading for today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples ahead of him and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door, outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying this colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On the day that Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem on a donkey, surrounded by people waving palms and shouting Hosanna, another procession was taking place on the other side of the city. Although we are well familiar with the story of Palm Sunday, few people today realize that it was a carefully planned response to a procession that took place every year on that same day and that Jesus' entrance into the city was meant to make a mockery of that procession. The first Palm Sunday took place on the first day of Passover, the week-long Jewish holiday that commemorates the Exodus, when, jo when Moses brought the nation of Israel out of Egypt and out of slavery. But two millennia after Moses parted the Red Sea, the Jewish people were once again under an oppressive rule, this time the Roman Empire. Every year on the first day of Passover, when Jews from all over the empire would gather in Jerusalem to celebrate this holy day, the Roman governor of Judea would enter the city from the west in a show of imperial power, surrounded by cavalry and foot soldiers, decked out in their finest armor and weapons. It served as a reminder to the people of the strength of the empire and a deterrent to anyone who might use the gathering to stir up rebellion. And there was a reason why the Roman Empire, which kept such a tight military control on all of the lands that it had conquered, would be so concerned about the tiny nation of Judah rising up against them. The people of Judah had been awaiting the one who would deliver them, who would free them from Roman rule and build them up into a great nation. They were awaiting the Anointed One, the Son of David, the Messiah. They were awaiting a great military leader, the rightful king of Judah, and before Jesus came on the scene, a number of men claiming to be the Messiah had already come and gone, attempting to stir up a rebellion to drive out the Romans. However, each of these rebellions had been thoroughly squashed, and the fake Messiah swiftly executed. Still, the Roman governors worried that someone claiming to be the Jewish Messiah would come along and unite the Jewish people into an army to liberate themselves. And so each year on the Passover, that time of year when the Jews remembered the time when God came to their aid to free them from oppressive rule, the Romans filled the streets with, with soldiers to ensure that it didn't happen again. And then one year Jesus showed up, and he did the opposite of what everyone was expecting. At this point, there were already rumors going around that Jesus was the Messiah based on his miracles and teachings. In fact, the entire first half of the Gospel of Mark is dedicated to demonstrating that Jesus is the Messiah. The very first words of the Gospel are, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. By the time Jesus arrived in Jerusalem that year for the Passover, the people were already beginning to celebrate him as the expected Messiah. And those who followed him were not the powerful and rich or the religious ruler, 
leaders, but the poor and oppressed people among whom Jesus spent most of his ministry. And so while the rich and powerful would have been across town, silently watching Pontius Pilate and his soldiers parade into the city, it was the lowest of society who cheered and sang Hosanna as Jesus rode by on a donkey. And while the Jewish religious leaders had already been plotting to kill Jesus because he was challenging their power and authority, it was most likely the triumphant entrance that made the Romans take notice of him and realize he might be a threat to their rule. That threat to both Jewish and Roman authorities would have been what led to his death five days later. But when Jesus entered Jerusalem, it wasn't what anyone expected. Instead of organizing the people into a militia to oppose the Roman army and liberate the Jewish people, he made a mockery of all of their expectations, while at the same time proclaiming who he was. At the beginning of Mark 11, we read that Jesus begins his entrance from the Mount of Olives to the east of Jerusalem. It was from there that the Jews believed the battle for liberation would begin. While the Romans entered from the west, the Messiah would enter from the east. And so Jesus began his campaign, so to speak, from Bethany on the Mount of Olives, signifying that he was bringing liberation to the people. From there we see that Jesus had planned his entrance carefully. He sends two of his disciples ahead to fetch a colt, or a young donkey, as it says in other translations. He already knows that it's there because he had prearranged it with the owners, as well as a sign for the disciples to give. When some people ask why they are taking the donkey, he tells them to answer, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. The people watching the donkey are expecting the disciples to come for it so that Jesus may use it, even though it has been some time since Jesus was last in the area. But he planned it this way because he knew the donkey was essential to the point he was making. First, although today we generally consider the donkey to be a lowly animal, in that time it was an animal fit for a king. By choosing to ride rather than walk, he was declaring that he was the Messiah, the son of David. And although the donkey evokes the royal tradition, it also evokes the humility of Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. While the donkey was used as a royal mount, in times of war and after a great victory, a horse or a chariot was used. Although we refer to this passage as the triumphant entry, the donkey doesn't signify triumph. Instead, it signifies humility. In preparing to enter the city, Jesus sends his disciples to make the preparations necessary, to gather the necessary materials for his campaign. But the only thing that he needs is a donkey. No weapons, no chariots like the Romans across the city, just a donkey. By choosing a donkey, he demonstrates both that he is king, but also that he is humble and lowly. And it stands in a stark contrast to the great show of wealth and power happening on the other side of the city. Second, the donkey signifies his holiness as the son of God. When Mark says that he rode on a colt, he means an animal that has never been ridden before. This is another demonstration that he is king, because there is a tradition that no one else could ride the animal that the king rides. But it is also reminiscent of the law. The book of Numbers tells us that according to the law, in order to purify themselves from sin, the people had to use water mixed with the ashes of a red heifer which had never been yoked. An animal that, has, that was to be used for a sacred purpose could not have been previously used for a profane purpose. By choosing an animal that has never been ridden, that had never been used for an everyday purpose, Jesus implies that, as the Son of God, he is using it for a holy purpose. So he enters the city riding on this young donkey that has never been ridden before, and the people spread their cloaks on the road for him to ride over. In both Jewish and Roman culture, this was considered a sign of respect and honor to leaders, and it's highly unlikely that any Jewish person would have been doing the same for Pontius Pilate that day. 
Yet this crowd, made up mostly of the poor and the lowest members of society, honor Jesus by doing this. And at the same time, they shout, Hosanna, which derives from the Hebrew phrase, Save us, please. And they declare, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. But at this moment, they're still expecting him to lead them into battle against the Romans and liberate them all. The coming kingdom they speak of is a restored kingdom of Israel. They're expecting to be saved physically. They're expecting that Jesus will rebuild Israel to its former glory when David ruled as king, because they still don't understand what the Messiah really is. And he reaches the temple, and the expectation would have been that the Jews would set him up as their king, the rightful heir to the throne in Jerusalem as the son of David. But instead, we have one of the most anticlimactic endings to any story in the Bible. Because instead of being made king, or instead of leading the people in rebellion, Mark says that when Jesus entered the temple, he looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Instead of doing what everyone expected, he went right back to where he started at the beginning of the day. I imagine this moment as being similar to that scene in Forrest Gump, where after he runs across the United States for over three years, he stops, and Forrest looks at all of the people who've been following him, and they're waiting expectantly for him to say something profound. And he just says, I'm pretty tired now. I think I'll go home. While everyone is expecting Jesus to do something, to make a profound speech, to stir up the people with his inspiring words, to perform some grand miracle, instead he just looks around, and he gathers his friends and he leaves without saying a word. He has just declared through his actions that he is King, Messiah, and Son of God. And then he just walks away without a single word. And in doing so, he mocks not only the pomp and the grandeur of the Romans, but also the expectations of all of his Jew Jewish followers. Because while they're expecting him to be a leader, a grand military leader, he is about to show them that the Messiah is so much more. They are expecting a physical liberation from their oppressors, but by the end of the week, he will have brought them a much greater liberation. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew how the people would interpret his entrance into Jerusalem. He wanted to make a point, to subvert all of their expectations. It was perhaps this action of walking out of the city as though nothing had just happened that caused the crowd to turn on him on Friday. They thought he was the Messiah. They thought he was going to liberate them. And then he let them all down. Yet they didn't realize that Jesus was telling them in, their resp in response to their shouts of Hosanna, Yes, I am the Messiah, and I will save you, but not in the way that you think. It's not until a week later, when he's raised from the dead, that people begin to understand what he was doing. His true purpose for coming was so radically different that even those who had listened to his teachings and witnessed his miracles couldn't fully understand until after they had witnessed his execution and resurrection. Jesus did not come to align himself with any political powers then or now. He did not come to be a military hero or to favor any government. He didn't come to fulfill our earthly desires for victory or prosperity. He didn't come so he could be used by any leaders to further their power or agenda. He came to bring salvation to all who call upon his name, without favoring any one people over the other. He has no concern for any of the categories we use to divide, divide ourselves. His concern is not for the powerful, but for the lowly and oppressed with whom he aligned himself repeatedly over the course of his ministry, because he didn't come to form any earthly kingdom. Just as the Jews expected that he would be the one to rebuild the kingdom of Israel, nations and kings and emperors and presidents throughout the past two millennia have called upon his name, expecting to receive favor and blessing upon their rule. But that's not how any of it works. Jesus shows us through his actions on Palm Sunday that he is here to build a greater kingdom, 
one not ruled by human beings, but by God, in which all are invited and welcome. Through the events of Holy Week, through his death and resurrection, Jesus made it possible for all who believe in him to be part of the kingdom. While the people waved palm branches and shouted, Hosanna, save us, Jesus was preparing something so much greater than what they expected. They expected a physical salvation for the nation of Israel, but he was preparing the ultimate salvation that is offered to all people. While we as human beings may have our own ideas of what the Messiah and the kingdom should be, Jesus comes in, shaping up all of our expectations and bringing something even greater than we ourselves could ever imagine.